Okay. Welcome everyone to the Far Side Business Builder. Thank you so much for joining us today. I see we have a good turnout and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, today we are hearing from Graven, Gra Graham Stephen of Bisbal. Graham, I got your name right the second time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to hearing all about this. Uh, by way of introduction, Graham is a CA with two decades of experience who joined together with two other professionals in South Africa to solve a problem faced by both accountants and business owners in how do you get an affordable business valuation quickly. So he's going to tell us all about business value, how you build it, and uh, how you can get to it in the first place. And I'm going to hand over to Graham so that I stop tripping over my tongue. Great. Tamron, thanks so much for having me. And it's always a pleasure to you know, engage with you and your community. Um, and we really are delighted to be here today. Um, so as Tamara's already done the intro, she's done half my, half my talk already, but <laughs> thanks for that. As, as she said, my name's Graham. Um, and, you know, we launched Bizwell, as she mentioned, you know, about four months ago. Um, well, for what we saw was a real gap in the market, and that was, you know, to enable business owners, accountants, intermediaries, consultants, growth advisors, a way to help you assess the value of your business. Um, and the thinking behind this was twofold. One is that traditionally things like these have been very inaccessible. You know, you go to your accounting firm or your big four and you ask for valuation in your business and it's 100,000 Rand before you're out the starting blocks, if you're lucky. Um, and we were driven by this desire to make it simple and accessible to everybody. Um, our two partners, uh, a gentleman by the name of Howard Blake, who... He's the gray hair in the room. Um, he, he just turned 60 uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, he's built over 20 businesses. Um, and my other colleague, the finance ghost, he's an ex-corporate finance wizard. Some of you might follow him on Twitter and what have you. Very outspoken in terms of investments, but straightforward. Um, and we wanted to bring that to the world of entrepreneurs, um, business owners, um, and we actually joined today by Paul Krobler, who's actually one of our partners. He, he's the IT brains behind you know, the guys that built this well. So Paul, thanks for joining us as well. Um, and I think what we wanted to do is to kind of create a discovery health check version of a business valuation. You know, so within 10 minutes to get a very good read on whether your business is what it's worth, uh, where some of the hotspots are, um, and what can you do to improve the value of that? So the format of today's discussion, um, so it's the first time for me on, on, on the far side uh, group, but is a 20, 30 minute presentation. We're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, valuations and how we value a business. And then we're gonna dive a little bit into what are some of the levers that you can pull and what are some of, what do we think are some of the big things in terms of, you know, increasing the value of your business. Uh, for those of you who've been following Tamron's post and that she's been talking quite a bit about that over the last few weeks. So, you know, if we we're going to build on that. Um, I'd really like this to be, you know, conversational. So I think the key part of these sessions is the questions at the end. So please, guys, um, you know, type your questions in the chat. Once you've had the chat, like make a note. I'd love to engage in the discussion after the formal presentation. So look forward to that. So to kick off, I need to share my screen. Sorry, if I'm using different software to what I usually use. So give me one second. Okay. And can you guys all see? Should be a Bizwell screen with a little stylized boardroom. You guys all got that. Okay. Yep. All right. So we've all heard the concept of starting with the end in mind. Um, and I think we all ask ourselves as, as business owners, what, what does this actually mean? You know, so for some people, it's actually having your own business because you want, you know, you want sort of freedom. Okay. Um, it might, you, you, you might not have this idea of wanting to go build out something to sell, for instance, you know, you might just like, you know, 
being able to have a business that earns you an income um, and you can manage your own time. That's okay. Some people are building towards an exit or sale from their business. You know, some people start a business with the sole objective of selling it one day and, ret and retiring from that. Others are in existing businesses and they come from what they're doing, but they're getting a bit older and they're thinking about retirement and they're thinking about, well, you know, when I stop working, can, can this business go without me? Can it continue to provide me with an income? Can I sell it? So, so there's a bunch of reasons why you might start a business. Um, but ultimately, though, if you, if you peel away, most business owners have a number. Okay. And, and what we mean by a number is it's unique to each of us, but it's that sort of amount of money or cash that kind of gives you the financial means that you can choose to work rather than having to work. But the reality is, is if you want to realize a number like that, you've got to build, I guess, to use a, to use a bit of a cliche, something called an asset of value. So it's something that has value independent of you having to do all the work. Um, and it's hard, particularly for a lot of us, you know, who've got smaller businesses, small teams. If you don't work, sometimes no income comes in. Um, so as a business owner, it can't just be about the cash flow and the drawings, okay? But those are important, you know, paying salaries and all of that. But you've got to, in the back of your mind, kind of think about, can your business exist without you? And it is an important construct. And largely, businesses only have real value if they can exist independently. You know, we get a question, yeah, but what about the brand? What about all of that? At the end of the day, you know, that's meaningless if it can't exist without you as, as the business owner. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. You know, um, it sounds quite morbid, but the sort of hit by the bus test. What happens if you get hit by a bus? You know, can your business carry on? What's it worth if you're not around? So once you know your number, um, and once you understand that your business needs to exist independently of you, that's where valuations come in. So that valuation allows you to sort of measure what is your business worth? Okay, where are you currently? Um, and it also allows you to sort of plan into the future to say, you know, where do you want to get to? What is your number? You know, some, some people are lucky. They go and they run their valuation and they're like, wow, I can sell and go and retire tomorrow. Others look and they say there's this, this chasm of where, where they need to get to. So I think that's where our tool in particular becomes quite helpful is you can run scenarios to kind of figure out how to get to where you want to go. And then importantly is developing a plan to get there. Um, you know, I think some of Tamron's posts over the last few days are saying, you know, even, even if you're just running your business as a, as a one-man band, you've got it at the back of your mind. So like, what is the plan? How do you want to develop a plan to get to, to your number? And as fellow entrepreneurs, I know it's hard, you know, and it's really hard to get there. And that's, that's also part of the sort of reason behind why we built Bizwell is we wanted to, you know, help business owners understand what the potential of their business is and then develop plans to be able to get there. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about how to build a more valuable business. So before I can talk about how we do that, we need to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how you value a business. So if you understand what goes into valuing a business, then it's easier to understand what can you do to influence that value. So when you value a business, there's essentially four elements that you have to think about when you, when you do that. The first one, as I mentioned before, is independence. Okay, so can the business operate without you? Um, Tamron's maybe a case in point here. No, so, so technically she's on holiday up near the Kruger, I believe. Um, which is, yeah, you know, but, but could this webinar have carried on without her? Okay. And that's, that's a question I guess we need to, we need to ask. The second is the context and time. So that does matter in terms of your business and your business valuation. And the example I used in one of our previous webinars was one of, um, the Eiffel Tower, you know, so the Eiffel Tower was built, um, a hundred years ago, or just over a hundred years ago. And at the time, it was meant to kind of be assembled for an exhibition and taken down a few years later. So if you had to ask what that Eiffel Tower was worth 100 years ago versus what it is worth today, today it's probably one of the most famous tourist attractions in the world, bringing millions of visitors to Paris. Um, yeah, I don't know what the foot flow is through the Eiffel Tower, but the value of that building is far greater today than it was 100 years ago. And what's changed has been the context. It's now a tourist attraction. And a different time, a different era. The third point is the economic environment. 
you know, and, and sometimes we forget about this, but, you know, the economic environment that you're operating in has a massive impact on the value of your business. Um, you know, if, if it's a buoyant environment, it's a rising tide, everyone's positive, typically businesses tend to have higher valuations in a growth environment versus when you're heading into a recession, negative sentiment, you just have to look at the markets, you know, to see how that holds true. You know, there's, there's a threat of war and suddenly the stock markets plummet, you know, so the economic environment does make a difference. And then I guess at a more sort of micro level, it comes down to cash flows and the quality of those cash flows. You know, so that's, that's one of the fundamentals when we value a business is looking at the cash flow and the quality of those cash flows. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into what that actually means just now. So when you value the business, we look at these things. There's a number of tools and techniques that we use. For any accountants in the room, you know, you'll hear things like uh, net asset value, discounted cash flow, earnings multiples. These are all just different methods that we use to try and ascertain a value. And those are technical tools that we use. But on the other hand, there's also sort of the, the, the sort of art to this. At the end of the day, your business is only worth what somebody else is willing to, to pay for it. Um, you know, there's that emotional aspect, which is, which is sometimes neglected. Um, and sometimes people, because there's an emotional attachment, will overvalue their business. You know, it's all that blood, sweat and tears that you've put into it, all the late nights. I mean, surely that must be worth something. Um, but often it's not. Um, and on the flip side, somebody else who's buying your business might have an emotional attachment to something you've done and it might be worth a lot more. So, you know, those are sort of intangibles. So we're not going to dwell too much on those today, but I think it's important to recognize that those things do exist. So give me one second to navigate my slides. Yeah, sorry, I'm clicking in the wrong place. Okay. So I'm going to start with this quote, and it um, is a quote by, by Ray, Ray Lewis, who was an NFL player. I'm not much of a football fan, but Ray Lewis said, greatness is a lot of small things done well. Okay. So when we think about building a valuable business, I think this is a useful like, framing to have in mind. It's not, often not a silver bullet. It's not one thing that you go and you do, and suddenly you win the lotto and you've built this magnificent business. Like most things in life, great businesses are built by building and executing lots of small initiatives over a period of time and doing those to a really high standard. Now, it, it obviously sounds really obvious. Um, and <laughs> We all know these things, but, you know, evaluation at the end of the day is the outcome of all of these initiatives. You can't create value in a business without doing sensible things and doing these things slightly better every single day. And you know, when you take away all the sort of scientific terms and all of that sort of thing and, and, and the complexity in valuing a business, the key drivers are usually those common sense things that you expect them to be. Okay. So we're going to dive into what some of those are. Okay. So I'm a parent and, and I think some of you guys are or have been parents. Um, or if you don't, you might have little cousins or nephews or nieces. But either way, I think most of us have at some stage been exposed to a toddler's fight for independence. Okay. And just how, I guess, at times frustrating, but also how beautiful that journey can be. Um, and in a business, it's no different. Okay. So without independence, as I said earlier, business has got no value. But the difference with a business and a toddler is a toddler instinctively knows how critical this, this is. And he'll fight for a tooth and nail. Okay. A business won't. A business, you know, is, is, is sort of an intangible, inanimate thing. It won't fight for its independence on its own. So, so you as the founder or the business person needs to actually fight that fight. Um, and if a business can't exist without the founder, it's got no value. It's a tough pill to swallow. I know it is. You know, um, as a fellow founder myself, it's a wonderful example. Before we started BizDal, you know, I had my own I still do my own consulting and advisory firm. And I was the advisory, okay? If I didn't rock up at a client and do the work and give the work, there was no income at the end of the month. Um, and, you know, that is a really difficult position to be in. You know, suddenly, you know, you're actually not a, 
you know, you don't have a job earning a salary, but you're self-employed. And, and, and it was really hard for me to get to that realization to say, actually, you know what? You know, consulting in and of itself is not a sustainable business if you're doing the work. So I had to go through a hard journey to say, look, if I want to keep the consulting business going, you know, I'm going to have to get people to come in and do some of that work for me. I'm going to have to let go of some of that. And also I have to think about what else can I build that's adjacent to this that can operate independent of that. Um, and that's what, I guess, Bizlal was kind of born out of the seed. So how do we build something that can exist without us having to do all the work all the time? And that journey to creating that value is really difficult. You know, it's, as I said, it's made possible by bringing other people into your business. And sometimes that's hard. You know, it requires training. Sometimes it's easier just to do it yourself. Okay. Um, putting in processes and structures. Um, building in a succession plan. You know, and, and, and when people look to buy your business, that's one of the first things they look at from a due diligence perspective. They ask yourself the question is, you know, how many employees do you have? You know, what is the skill of those, those employees? You know, can you, can you actually take leave for a week and your business can continue to operate? Um, and I think that's something that as a business owner, you really need to ask yourself, you know, if you step away, what's going to happen? Who's going to step in there? Have you trained people to, to kind of run the business? Have you trained people to kind of take over when you're not there? And if you're serious about selling your business one day, you have to treat it like raising your child. And of course, once you've you know, thought about this independence, okay, um, you've got to make sure that the rest of your business is as strong as possible. Okay. And there's a number of levers that you can pull in the business. And often the hard part is saying is, is what are the levers that make the most difference? You know, so you can focus on things like revenue. How do you grow revenue? Um, things like gross margin and not to sound too technical, but you know, what is the difference between the price of what you're selling versus the price of what you're buying? Uh, your operating costs, um, things like your working capital, your balance sheet structure, those things all matter. But at the end of the day, without revenue, without income coming into your business, you've got nothing. Okay, So we're going to start a little bit um, of a discussion around, around revenue. Okay. So in the world of startups, you'll hear terms like total addressable market, you'll hear words like scale. And before you panic and think, oh, listen, you know, I need to be sitting in a in a a coffee shop in San Francisco, it's worth considering this with your own business. So, you know, when you set up and you're building a business, how big can you get? So realistically, you know, how how big is that market? And that might be in your home region, it might be in your own suburb. Okay. It might be in other regions. It might be in your country. And I'm not saying you have to have aspirations to become a global business, but you have to start by asking the question is how big can you get? Okay. Secondly, you need to ask is, you know, are you different enough to keep growing before other people come in, copycat, undercut you, and take over your market? You don't want to be the person doing all the hard work only for somebody else to come in and, and, and take over from you. So you've got to think hard about what is your differentiator, okay? And that differentiator might be something as simple as, you know, we have a personal touch. It might be something, might be a technical advantage. It might be a product advantage, okay? Has got to be there. And, and a business like Apple has been very good at this in the past, you know, in terms of how they launch their new features and their product and all of that sort of stuff. But even at a small business, you constantly need to be thinking is how am I different and how am I, how am I differentiating myself from everybody else in the market? And that's going to help you to continue to grow and to maintain market share. On the other hand, you also have to look at the market you're in. You know, so is the market you're operating in, is it shrinking or growing? Okay. Now, sometimes people build a business and the market changes. And I'll use an example of the, you think about the last guy to design a horse-drawn carriage before the motor vehicle was invented, you know? So at the point of the motor vehicle being invented, suddenly the market for horse-drawn carriages fell off a cliff, okay? It was still a niche market. There were still people who loved riding horses and carriages and all of that. But at that point, it became, it became a shrinking market. And then if that happens, you have to think about, can you still stick around and sort of serve that niche? Um, or is there an adjacent offering that you need to move into? 
And the last point I want to talk about in terms of in terms of this is the word moat. So I'm sure some of you have heard about the word moat. Um, and this is sort of a Benjamin Graham or Warren Buffett concept. It's, you know, investors and somebody looking to buy into your business looks for businesses with a strong defensible competitive advantage. So you know, if you have a competitive advantage, you have to ask yourself, is it defendable and why? You know, or is it something that somebody can just copy and replicate in any case? So you know, those are some important concepts to think about when you think about you know, growing your business and the revenue behind that. The next example I want to use is Jenga. <laughs> um, and the question we're going to tackle here, looking, looking at the Jenga analogies, is what does quality revenue mean? So if so any of you have played the game Jenga, the principle is that you know, you've got to build a higher tower. And that the, the, the tower, you can afford to take a few blocks out of the bottom the foundation because there's still enough support. But if you get to a point where suddenly the whole tower collapses and, and revenue is much the same, okay? The more sources of revenue you've got, typically the more resilient the business is, okay? And it's even better if those revenue sources are diversified, you know? So if they're across different geographies, different product ranges, not just one product in one area. Um, so, it's difficult, you know, because to do that, you have to go and you have to diversify, okay? But having more blocks is generally better, okay? The more customers you have is better, okay? In fact, when, 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 when you do a business valuation, one of the first questions we ask is, you know, is about your customer concentration risk. So how much, how many customers do you have? What percentage of revenue comes from your core customers? And that's, that's a bit like the Jenga tower. When you dig a little bit deeper, okay, some of the things we look at is, you know, is an annuity income versus one-off income. Now, annuity income is the type of income that says, you know, every month I get this income in. So a subscription-based business would have annuity income, for instance. A business that every month you have to start from zero is really hard, okay, because you've got no income at the beginning of the month. Um, and businesses that have strong annuity income typically have higher values. So if you're running a business, think about how you're charging for your products. Can you charge a membership fee as opposed to charging for a per use fee for argument's sake? Um, the, the, the gyms in South Africa do that. You know? You, you know, there's a reason why you can't just go and pay 50 Rand and go and do a workout. You know, they, they want the annuity income so that they, can, that they can rely on that every single month. And then the other thing to look at is the cash conversion of that revenue. Okay, so, a lot of businesses and all of us, we, we, we're dependent on, on debtors, okay? So, you know, and we have to look and say, are the people that we're selling to, can they pay us back, okay? And that's really, really important. So, you know, at the end of the day, cash is what counts. There's a lot of businesses that have got, you know, great revenue on paper, but people owe them the money. Um, and without being able to collect that revenue and have a strong cash conversion of that revenue, um, it's really, really hard. And sometimes as a small business, when you start out, it is difficult. You know, you, you, you're waiting for people to pay you at the end of the month. Or, you know, often people will go and they'll move from serving smaller clients and they, they land a deal with a big corporate, okay? And everyone thinks like, you know, the silver bullet has arrived. I've landed a contract with a corporate. Often what happens with corporates, though, is they will only pay you on 60 days or 90 days, you know? So you've done all this work. And you've got to wait three months to get your income in. In the meantime, you have to pay your VAT and your tax and your employees and all of that sort of stuff. So it's something as a small business you really need to think long and hard about. Um, and, you know, how do you make sure that you can collect those revenues early? Nobody also likes as a business owner to pick up the phone to say to somebody and say, hey, listen, you need to pay me. So think about that. That, that cash conversion is really, really key. So. To summarize, and I know I've been, been talking for a bit, is you know, there's, there, there, there's three main concepts that we've spoken about in terms of evaluation. One is that it's about common sense. Okay, so doing the things that you naturally want to do in any case, okay, think about it, will improve your business, and doing lots of small things over time is the way forward. The second, and probably most importantly, is the business has to be independent of the founder. Okay, so what are you doing to make sure that you have succession in place, redundancy in place. How do you ultimately work yourself out of the business? 
And the third one is about revenue, okay? And thinking about that revenue. What is your growth potential? What protects your market position? Um, what is the quality of your earnings? And what are the things that can make your business more resilient when it comes to revenue? These for me are probably the three, three of the most fundamental things in terms of valuing the business. Now, yeah, there's hundreds of other things that we can, we can dive into, okay? But I think these are the fundamentals. So there's other things such as margin, and we're not going to go into them today because we obviously don't have the time to, to dive into all of those. But you know, things like your pricing strategy, unit economics, operating leverage, um, cash flow, you know. So we spoke a little bit about like, how do you convert your cash? That's really, really important. Um, managing the sales funnel, you know, so Having people knocking on the door and then actually then getting to go sit down and order a meal at your restaurant, how do you do that? Okay. Um, you know, financial planning and controls, that's often an area which is often also neglected. You know, having things documented and having things written down so that you know when somebody's buying your business, they can actually you know, see that you thought about these things. Um, the jurisdiction where your business is set up, you know, so you know, are you set up in a tax haven or you set up in Joburg, or you set up in Cape Town, those things all matter. So we're not going to go in today, unfortunately, there's not enough time to dive into all of those. And, and hopefully, um, Tamron will, will invite us back at some point to talk about some of those things. Um, but yeah, hopefully, you know, we've spoken a little bit about today about some of those things which can really improve your business. Um, I'd like to dive into the Q&A section uh, and take some questions from, from the audience. Before I do that, though, um, you know, I'd just like to quickly talk about a promo that we're running and, and, and Tamron kindly has given us the opportunity to do this. So if any Fireside members want to understand what the value of their business is, they can go to our website, www.bizval.co. Um, and if you use the code FAR001, you'll qualify for 15% off your business valuation. So, you know, please feel free to reach out to me or via Tamron if you want to connect with us. Um, and we'd be delighted to, to offer you that promo. Um, but I think with that, Tamron, if we can maybe move on to the Q&A section. You know, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Um, and yeah, we'll do our best to kind of add some flavor to those questions and, and hopefully give you some sensible answers. Awesome. Thanks so much, Graham. That was a great presentation. Um, I think if you do want to ask Graham a question, you have a couple of options. You can put them in the chat if you are shy. Otherwise, you please uh, switch your camera and your microphone on and just join us on the screen. We'll have a good chat in the gallery. I'm going to stop sharing, Tamara, if you don't mind. See, see everyone. Okay. Hendrik, do you have a question? You're on mute. Yes, thank you. Very much. I do. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Graham. That was really insightful. We're a, we're a brand new business. We're just over a year old and doing our best to establish a family kind of business that uh, kind of leaving a legacy for uh, my son and, and whoever comes after. Um, so what I'm interested in is when you build the business, how, how do you plan to create value um, in the longer term? Um, we're obviously starting with sweat capital, so um, you know there's no real real assets or anything. It's it's really just the, the amount of effort. And, and I, if I remember correctly, you said that that doesn't really count for much. But how do we turn that into an, an actual value uh, for the future? It's a great a great question. Um, so I can't see the name Henrik. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, and and I think I think the reality is that. Having a long-term mindset is absolutely critical. Um, you know, it's a bit like when you're building a house, right? You can go and quickly build the house and not build the foundation. You can get to roof level very quickly. I think particularly in family businesses and wanting to do that, it's, it's even harder sometimes, okay? Because, you know, you're trying to, you know, you're also trying to put food on the table at the same time, right? Um, but I think what you have to do when, you, when, you, when you're building a family business is you almost have to not think of it as a family business. And I know that's really hard to do, okay? Um, one of the challenges with family businesses is automatically people think that, you know, my son needs to become the next CEO or my son needs to move into that position. Um, and in family businesses, when you think long-term, you do need to be extra careful about thinking around 
who are the best people for the job? Um, you know, and you mustn't be afraid of thinking sometimes actually we need to bring professional or outside help in to do things better than what we can do. You know, I've, I've seen it lots of times with family businesses, you know, the dad might be a charismatic salesperson. He's great at going out and selling and doing the business. And the son is a computer geek. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, that person's never going to be able to run that business successfully. Okay. Uh, and sometimes they don't want to. So I think with a family business, the first thing is you have to make sure that the family members who are involved are all bought into that vision. Okay. They all want to create that. And, and creating something like a, like a family charter or business charter is actually quite a useful thing to do. And I know that sounds quite sort of, um, you know, what's the word, abstract. Um, and that, I think, with a family business is some of the harder things to do. To, to go into the second part of the question, I guess, is the fundamentals are all the same, though. You know, so ultimately, a valuable business is a business that produces cash flow, okay, and it produces revenue over time, okay. So for me, that's where you need to, to focus. Is saying, how do I build a business that's got resilient cash flows, focus on the revenues? How do I do that? How do I build my sales funnel? How do I do all of those good things? Okay. Um, because that's what inherently gives it value. And you'll get to a point then where if you want to keep it as a family legacy, the business is standing on its own two feet, right? Um, so the future generations that will then have the choice to say, hey, I can either sell the business or I can keep it in the family. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no need to ever sell a family business. There's, there's plenty of successful family businesses which always stayed in the family, okay? Equally, there's other family businesses where they've listed and they've gone public and the family's taken a, a, a back seat. Um, you know, but I think you've got to be clear about what you want to do. And I think you also have to accept that as you move on to the future generations, that they might have different views to you. And that's often what's really hard in family businesses is you're trying to hand over to the next generation and, you know, the founder or the dad or the patriarch or the matriarch, you know, kind of doesn't want to let go. So uh, it's not an easy answer, but Henrik, hopefully that gives you a little bit of flavor and sense around how to do that. So let me recap. Family charts is really, really important. Okay. I think also focusing on being open to bringing in experts when you need to bring in experts. And sometimes that's really hard as well, um, you know, because you need to think about how do you incentivize those experts and how do you, you know, sometimes create value for them. And sometimes in family businesses, that becomes a conflict because you bring in a professional manager, but you just pay him a salary, you're not prepared to share in the equity. So when you're talking about that family charter, that's really, really important to say, if we're going to bring in people, are we going to allow them to share in the equity of the business going forward? You know, and what, what does that mean? Um, and yeah, the third point is obviously, you know, just, you know, focusing on revenues and focusing on growth and focusing on, you know, the fundamentals of the business. Um, and maybe one last point, which I didn't mention is it comes into the family charter piece is have a very clear mechanism for resolving disputes. Okay. Be clear, articulate what that needs to be because it will arise in the family business, okay? Um, don't think you can rely on the strengths of the relationship. So I think having a, you know, the basics like a proper MRI and a proper thing in place around how you make decisions in the business, even more important in a family business than a non-family business in some ways, so. Cool, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Peter, did you have a question? Yeah, my question would be um, in various industries, you get told of different ways of valuing your business. Um, I have a labor law HR consultancy, so it's sort yeah. of service related. Um, I've heard that, say, three years, your what your take home pay is would be a fair value of your business, but you pay yourself. Is that a way to do it? So, so Peter, I mean, it's. <laughs> You know, we get this all the time. You get this sort of industry rule of thumbs as to, you know, what, what is your business worth? Um, and sometimes those rule of thumbs are not there to serve the business owner. Sometimes those rule of thumbs are there to serve, let's call it buyers who want to snap up lots of different law firms. And it happens a lot in, in, in sort of like professional services businesses. And um, uh, brokerage firms are another example where there's these, these rule of thumbs. Those aren't always true, okay? And I think you've got to be very careful of simply following the, those rule of thumbs, okay? Um, 
you know, and that's where I guess we look a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper than that. You know, so if you took that as an example, you know, you might be a labor lawyer, somebody else might be a labor lawyer, you might be paying yourself 500,000 rand a year, somebody doing exactly the same job might be paying themselves a million rand a year. Okay, so you, know, you can't look at that as, as a metric. You've got to look at how the business is performing. Um, typically, what you would do is you'd look at the business profits, okay, and you would look at what would you pay somebody to do your job if it wasn't you, okay, um, a professional manager, in other words, and you would get a normal market-related salary from that. The way we value is, that's called an earnings multiple, what you're referring to, is it looks at the profit of the business, and it says similar industries, what do they sell for, okay, that's Kind of an earnings multiple view and it is a view that we use in our valuation and the other is what we call the discounted cash flow method of valuing the business so that looks at your profit and it says how sustainable is it how much is it growing into the future okay and what would what profits would you make over the next 5 10 15 years and what would they be worth today okay so obviously in that situation a business that's growing quickly um, is worth more than a business which is growing slowly okay a business which has got Good relations is worth a lot more. Now, we tend to believe that that is the, the better mechanism for valuing a business. Okay. Um, sometimes they'll be the same. Sometimes they won't. Okay. And when you're selling or somebody wants to buy your business or when you're negotiating, you need to be empowered because if somebody offers you three times, you want to be able to say, no, my business is actually worth five times or six times. And this is why. Okay. Most law firms are growing at 5%. I'm growing at 15%, okay. You know, most law firms have got, I don't know, <coughs> 10 customers. Um, I've got 100 customers, you know. So I think those rule of thumbs are dangerous because it disempowers you as the business owner. And that's what we're trying to do is say, hey, how do you dig deeper to know what are those levers that actually matter? You know, if you go and you watch one of our videos, we actually explain all those, those components. Um, so a long answer to, I guess, a short question is no, I'm not a big believer in rule of thumbs. Okay. Um, I think you need to go a little bit deeper like that. You know, it's a bit like saying, you know, all six, it's, it's stereotyping, you know, all six foot three tall, uh, I don't know, African-American men who weigh hundred kilos will make good sprinters. You know, I mean, that's, that, that's the danger with it. Uh, I don't think it goes deep enough. Awesome. Can, can I you. jump? Jump in there as well, uh, Graham, actually, because I saw a thing about this the other day. There was yeah. a, also someone who does business valuations, and they just made the comment that a, a lot of small business owners, they get really disappointed when a proper mm. business valuation is done Be mm. because of the fact that we've heard about these rules of thumb. So you think, oh, well, you know, my, my profit is this, and for my industry, it's it I can multiply it by by X. And that's what my business is worth. And the problem is that, like Graham was mentioning, there's so many other factors like independence, because if someone is going to buy your business, unless they are also a labor lawyer, they mm. don't necessarily want to be running the business. They just want to be earning the profit. So they have to hire someone to replace you. And yeah. often business owners do not pay themselves the right salaries. Correct. Yeah. They're normally paying an under market salary because you're trying to put as much money back into your business as possible in terms of growth and marketing and maybe hiring a team. So often we do not pay ourselves what we're supposed to and we get a much higher profit as a result and we think our business is worth more than it is. There's that and there's also the fact that, um, you, you know, if, if, if you are very entrenched in your business, your clients are also very emotionally connected to you. Mm. so there's also okay. the the danger that if you leave they'll just go look for another law firm and and, and i can use maybe just an analogy to, to talk about is is, is 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 thinking about a house a house is actually a very good example you know in terms of how you think about it so and, and i'll bring this all together here is you know if, if you buy a three-bedroom house with two garages and a swimming pool in monmouthton okay 200 square meters okay and all the houses in the area are very very similar you know the rule of thumb is you know, a house on that size stand goes for 2 million rand in Monmouth. Okay. That same house, okay, if it was in Camps Bay, might be worth 20 million rand. Okay. Um, you might also get the house in Monmouth, which is in the same, but somebody has gone on the inside, you know, and they've, they've got their, 
grandmother's paintings on the wall and you know they've got a whole bunch of emotional things that they put into it so for them you know that's where they grew up that's where they they spend time with their granny and all so, so to them the house might be emotionally worth a hell of a lot more our businesses are exactly the same okay um you know and 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 when it comes to valuing yes the sort of environment you're operating all that sets a ceiling so a house in Moulton might have a certain ceiling price you could spend five million rand on that house in Moulton it's unlikely somebody is going to spend 7 million rand for that house in Milton. Okay. Equally, you could spend 5 million rand up doing a house in Camps Bay and suddenly it's worth 50 million rand and not 20 million. So, you know, th those analogies are helpful because business is the same. Th those rule of thumbs are dangerous because they, they <laughs> you know, they sort of discount all those, those elements. Great stuff. Thanks, Tamron and Graham. <laughs> Uh, Claudia, do you have a question? Actually, at the moment now, I'm just listening here and going and uh, making notes. And as I say, I only started in February of this year, so it feels like I'm at the foot of this huge mountain. And I don't even know, should I start climbing here or there? But at least the things that you mentioned, Graham, looks like I'm looking at the right things. Um, but yeah, it is, um, I'm a virtual assistant, so it's only me. At this stage, hopefully it will grow so that I, I've, I've even got old colleagues that said, as soon as you grow, please let us know. <laughs> so, um, so at least I've got some backup if I need it, but I still still need to get there. But yeah, all of these, um, and we, you talked about revenue quality, it's actually amazing because yesterday I, I sort of started looking at how to diversify it and not just go one direction. So thanks, it, it really, it, it helps to just get the um, feedback that at least I'm looking at the right things. Yeah. Although yeah. I still have to, to climb the mountain. <laughs> you know, that, that's so important is, is it almost just jotting down on a piece of paper, you know, some of these things on the map that you've got for it. I mean, maybe as, as, as a story of encouragement, um, we, my, my son had an Afrikaans tutor, um, one of the disadvantages of living in the southern suburbs of Cape Town is that uh, <laughs> this is that our kids struggle with Afrikaans. Um, and, and she started also as a one-man uh, tutor a year and a half ago. We were, we were one of her first clients. Um, and she was run off the bone. And, and, and fortunately, Afrikaans improved to such a level we didn't need her anymore. And I saw her the other day, and she said she's now got nine tutors working for her, um, and she's managing um, the tutors. So... So we actually had this discussion with her when she started her business saying like, you know, how, she quit her job as a teacher to do private tutoring. This was during lockdown and COVID and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and she, we had this discussion with her said, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to go beyond just doing this yourself? And she took it to heart and she started hiring tutors you know, who she trusted and could maintain her brand and all of that sort of stuff. And now she's got a thriving business and a resilient business where she can actually go on holiday for three weeks and the money still comes in, you know? So, you know, you know, Gladi, I think you, you're in that similar sort of space, you know, you, you, you can think about those things. Yeah. It's, um, it's at this stage, it's so easy to just get caught up in getting the work that you have now before you're done and to forget that you have to think about next year and, you know, going on. And, um, I made it, and, for example, I made a rookie mistake and I, with one client, I spent way too much hours that I didn't get paid for, you know, and then you, you lose something else. So it's, as you said, I mean, that focus, having that focus, not just in your work, but with your business as well. Think of it as a baby. <laughs> yes, <laughs> oh, yeah, like? believe me, I'm still learning what to feed it and what, what <laughs> it feeds the tummy. <laughs> I, I just want to say as well, Khadi, you, 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 um, Yes, you're only two two years in, you said, um, but you're already going to be streets ahead of most people. Uh, I I have been in business now for 15 years. For the first 10 years, I ran it the wrong way. So you're you're already way ahead of the curve because if you're recognizing that you need to be focusing on these things in the second year instead of the tenth year, like I did, you're going to build a much stronger business much faster. Mm. So I hope so. I'm working, I'm working towards it. And um, and one thing I've also learned is um, to ask for help. If I'm not sure about something, ask for help. Because on your own, you're just going to crash and burn. 100%, yeah. 
On, on that note, I did put the Bizval uh, link in earlier and a reminder to use our code. If you are wondering where your business stands at the moment, you want a better idea of what the value is, anyone watching, please go click on that link, use the code, grab the discount, get your valuation and use it as your starting block to improve. Don't, don't let it, if it is much lower than you were expecting, don't let that bring you down. Go, okay, this is where I am now. This is where I want to be. And you begin to put your your building blocks in, in place. I'm also sharing the link for the Bizval newsletter because they share okay, really great. cool Thanks, <laughs> uh, blogs and articles and things that will help you in building those building blocks. Uh, and if you want a bit more one-on-one -on -one help, uh, you can give give us a shout at Farside. We do have a bunch of, of services that we offer in terms of things like helping you improve your cash flow, helping you remove yourself from the business in terms of systems development. And we've got a profitability enhancement package where we help you with your pricing and your revenue and all of that sort of thing. So if you have identified specific areas that you go, actually, I do need help with that, give us a shout. We'd love to help you. Um, otherwise, are there any other questions for Graham today? Are we all... Just a comment if I can. Um, in, in my consultancy, I try to keep the employees to the minimum and use contractors. Does that have any effect on your value or is that still seen as sustainable? Um... So I guess the, 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 the question of using contractors versus employees, I mean, is not necessarily a differentiator. I mean, in some instances, very good reasons for having contracts. I mean, what, what, what you would rather look at is how, you know, how committed and how loyal and are those contractors? You know, I mean, you obviously see labor law, so there's good reasons for using contractors sometimes. So that in and of itself is not necessarily an issue. And, and, and in today's day and world, I think often it is a lot more about contractors rather than employees. A lot of people have got two or three gigs running at the same time, you know, so so I think that's not a bad thing in and of, in and of itself. And, and sometimes when you have contractors, it actually can add value to the business for the simple reason that you need to have processes in place to train people, to get them up to speed, to do all of those sorts of things. Sometimes when you have employees, you know, that stuff and that long term that gets entrenched in their head and you don't go and develop all those sort of more sustainable processes. So you know, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. People, are, you, know, you know, the obvious answer would be, oh, no, they're not as committed and they contract to some of businesses worth less. Um, the, the other side is actually if you have contractors, you've got more flexibility to deal with up cycles and down cycles in business. So, you know, in seasonal businesses, for instance, you know, you hire people during the picking season or the harvest season and during the rest of the year you don't so it allows your business to match its cash flows a lot more efficiently so so so, so in many instances having contract workers can actually increase the value of your business um, but, but there's no you know right or wrong runs it depends on the business it depends on a whole bunch of things but it's good that you ask that question you know that's the those are the sorts of questions we want people to be asking um, and have a considered view on it and um, don't don't just Assume that's that's the biggest take out, I think, is is think hard about what are the levers and what matters to your business. And it's a common sense thing. You know, I'm sure, Peter, you've got, you've got a very good reason for having contractors. OK, and that comes back to the, the first point is, is, is it logical? Does it make common sense? And how would somebody else you know, view this if they're looking at it from the outside? And, and if the answer is yes, then invariably it probably adds value. <laughs> yes. Well, just from my perspective as well, I use a lot of contractors. Too. I, I have core employees, but we have quite a large outsource team. Um, and there's also a variety of reasons. The one is that some of the work is is seasonal. So, you, you know, you don't yeah. need, for example, tax consultants. I don't necessarily need one all the way here around, um, but I definitely need some help around provisional tax return time. Um, and I'm sure yours is, is a similar story. There's times of the year that you're going to need more help than, than the rest of the time. Also, un unfortunately, and, and you as a labor law a lawyer are going to know this, but um, hiring in South Africa can actually be quite high risk mm. because our labor laws are so good and they protect our employees and they're some of the best in the world and I'm very proud of them. The problem is that by protecting employees so much, they don't protect employers that much. Mm. So if you do get a bad apple, you have a bit of a problem. 
So, you know, it's also something to bear in mind when, when like Graham says, is, is there's got to be a logical reason. If you're in, in a situation where you would really like to try someone out for a longer period of time and see them in action, then having contractors makes far more sense. Um, yeah. And also, I think in terms of your business type, what, a, what gives you more value is maybe looking at rather a succession plan in terms of someone who manages your contractors rather than worrying how many contractors you have. Mm -hmm. Because if that one, if the important thing is who has contact with your clients. That's actually what's giving you value in your business because your client experience is what's going to count in terms of do they come back? Do they refer you? Do they give you good reviews? Uh, so the people who actually interact with your clients are more valuable in terms of your business value than are they employed or are they contracted or are they loyal? Uh, that, that I think, is, is something to think about more than, than the employment type. Yeah, and, and I think, Tamara, if I can maybe just add to that, it's also, it's also the motivation behind it. I mean, use a contract example. You know, if, if the motivation behind having contractors is to exploit employees, okay, we exploit people. Oh, so I don't have to pay the minimum or I don't have to give leave or whatever. I mean, that, that would invariably be a red flag to buy. You know, so if, if the motivation is solid and sound, um, you know, that, that's what people look through when they do a due diligence or they value your business. Um, and that carries more weight than, than anything else, I think. It's actually in my business got more to do with the type of work. Um, yeah. I don't need somebody who does employment equity every day of the week. I just exactly. them when one of my clients has a need, whereas the core work is more got to do with the discipline, performance management, misconduct issues, HR issues. Um, and for that, you can use employees because that's everyday stuff. So it's more got to be do with the type of work rather than anything else. Um, and as to the fairness of the labor law, I must tell you the bigger problem is that employers don't have the correct checks and balances in place. The law is very fair. But the employers don't do their bit and get everything in place. Then when the employees take them to CCMA or so, it seems very unfair. They, they think it's very unfair. They largely their own fault. Yeah. Why well, they need you. Hey, you know, we'll do a quick, we'll do a quick uh, uh, sale for my work law. If, if you don't know the labor law and the reasons that you need to have everything set up correctly, give Peter a shout before you start hiring people. <laughs> right. <laughs> Are there any, there are no other questions? I know, um, nope, I think we're done. Trika, thank you for joining us. Thank you to everyone who came today and uh, for the, the words in the chat and for the thank yous and the questions that I thought it was a really, really good chat. So thank you. Thank you, Graham, so much for, and we definitely will have you back, I think, to do a, a part <laughs> two at some stage. Um, so if, uh, if we all done, you can go on with your day and go build some more value in your business. And, and if I may, Cameron, just to, to have to the last one, thank you so much for inviting us, you know, and, you know, I love the, the intimacy of these sessions. It's really great. And, you know, I think just a closing thought for me, you know, is, is we're all business people. We're all trying to build something of value and, and just, you know, the opportunity to collaborate, you know, and to, you know, to share and refer business and you know stick to our lanes do what we're good at you know we do valuations but tamarin is great at helping you build the plans to actually get there you know so i think i think that's the thing about the world we operate in now and if we can you know just take that with us <coughs> it's so powerful so um thanks for the opportunity tamarin and we look forward to to partnering with you again thanks so much have a wonderful thanks day everyone thank you thanks guys cheers bye-bye